Well, now we come to card number 44, the Apostles Speak. And the reading for it in the back of your card is Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You know, we are so blessed to be able to pick up the New Testament and read words that were not just the work of people who lived 2,000 years ago, but actually read the very words of God in written form. The reason we can say this is because there might have been human hands with real life experiences and limited vocabularies to work with, but the mind governing what was written was the Holy Spirit. As it says, all scripture is God breathed or breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Or we can use Peter's words to say the same thing. And we have the prophetic words more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now that's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and verse 20. If you take the 27 books of the New Testament, you, you can imagine them as, as a house. We have the foundation, and this would be the first five books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Uh, these are the historical books or the record of the life of Christ from his birth to his ascension into heaven and what happens after that. And then you have what we would call the two side walls. On one side, we have the nine books written by Paul, known as the Pauline epistles, Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Then on the other side, we have the nine books known as the general epistles. And they are Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 2, 3 John, Jude and Revelation. Now we put a roof on the building with the four pastoral epistles. And they are 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Well, the four gospels were written between, say, AD 55 and possibly AD 90. Mark was first somewhere between 55 to 65 AD. Then Matthew was probably next. And he focused his gospel to the Jewish mindset, writing around 58 to 68 AD. And Luke, uh, he's the third one, ran about the AD 60 to AD 68. And, and then comes the gospel of John. By the way, Luke was writing to the Greek mind. Well, the Gospel of John was the last and, and it was probably written somewhere between AD 80 to AD 90. And there is a theme that runs through each of these Gospels, as, as I've already indicated. Matthew presents Jesus as the king, uh, Mark as the servant, Luke as the perfect man, and John as the son of God. Luke wrote his Gospel and the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which is the continuation of his gospel. And, and while it is addressed to a man named Theophilus, we, we have no idea who he is. But as Luke says, both books were the result of careful research of the events to ensure an accurate record of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ and the expansion of the church after his death, burial and resurrection. Now, Paul's nine epistles were written to seven different churches <clears throat> that he had birthed under the hand of God. Uh, problems and questions were addressed in each letter and what Paul wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is still the final authority 
for our walk of faith today. The same would be said for all the books of the New Testament. Romans was written from Corinth, and while Paul had not yet visited Rome, he wanted to give them a clear understanding using logic and reason and history and the history of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul presents the universal problem of human uh, kind, and then he spells out God's solution in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believing in the gospel changes our relationship with God from facing his righteous wrath to being reconciled to him and enjoying the peace and the assurance of eternal life which he gives. To ensure that we do not question the promises he gives by looking at how God passed over the Jewish nation and seemingly ignored all of the promises he made to them, Paul speaks of the restoration when the time of the Gentiles is complete. And then in the closing five chapters of his book, he discusses the implications of the Christian faith in daily living. The letter to the Corinthians was to answer questions and deal with uh, the erosion of the truth that had been allowed to become part of the life of this church. Uh, you come to the book of Galatians, and this was Paul's first letter ever written. And he deals with the question of how much of Jewish practice should be required of non-Jewish Christians? Well, the answer was simply none of it was to be added to Christ. It's Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, uh, according to the scriptures alone and the, to the glory of God alone. And while those words, which are the summary of the gospel came years later, they are certainly based on what Paul says in his letter to the Galatian church. You've got Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians. Uh, these are known as the prison epistles and uh, Paul wrote them while in prison in Rome. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, we have uh, our rags to riches story, uh, adoption, acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, the inheritance and the seal of the Holy Spirit, life and grace and citizenship in short, every spiritual blessing that we could have. And then in chapters four to six, uh, he teaches us how to live uh, of our true identity. Uh, Philippians, why, it's filled with joy and was written to encourage the Christians to keep expressing their humility and unity and have that servant-like attitude towards one another so that their faith would be a living testimony to the truth of the gospel. Uh, the book of Colossians is the most Christ-centered book in the Bible, I think, for people were losing sight of who Jesus is. And Paul brings them back to see that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians focuses on the great hope we have, that the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ shall be resurrected. And those Christians that are still living when he comes will be raptured with the resurrected dead to meet the Lord in the air. Then it's living with him forever. Now, there was confusion as to when this was going to occur. So Paul answers some of these issues in these letters. Well, this takes us to the four pastoral epistles written to Timothy and Titus, and the letter to Philemon fits in here as well. Uh, it is a letter to accompany a converted runaway slave called Onesimus, and he is returning to his owner, Philemon. And knowing that Philemon is a believer, Paul knows that this will be a great reunion. Uh, the church had grown and needed some direction as to how the organizational issues should be met. And they fell into two areas, namely shepherding the Christians by teaching and counseling from God's word 
Uh, this is to be the role of the elders or the overseers. And secondly, the practical needs of the believers were to become the role of the deacons. So 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus calls the church to adopt God's will for leadership within their church. The remaining epistles are known as the general epistles written by five different authors. Uh, one, Hebrews is by an unknown writer and the others are from the pens of John, uh, Peter, Jude and James. Hebrews was written by uh, an unknown author but to Jewish Christians and it presents the deity and the glory and the supremacy of Christ over the old system uh, of the religious law and the sacrifices in the Old Testament. And while God speaks in times past by the prophets, he has in these last days, as the writer says, given his final word through his son, who is superior to all things related to the old covenant. Uh, the book of James confronts the issue of hypocrisy head on. Uh, in this very practical letter, he teaches us that's not enough to talk the talk without walking the walk. We must live out in our daily actions and decisions the faith that we profess. And then you have 1 and 2 Peter. And Peter encourages Christians who are facing persecution and suffering because of their faith. He reminds them of the hope of their salvation and calls them to an unwavering loyalty and spiritual courage. And in the second letter, he warns about the teachers who will bring in false beliefs, taking hold of the faith and seeking to destroy it. 1, 2, 3 John, these three short letters of John, uh, they're so personal and express his care for his fellow Christians. He addresses old men, young men and babes, and, and he wants them to know that Jesus was God in the flesh, not some mystical ghost-like figure that was promoted at the time with Gnostic uh, heresies and by the Gnostic teachers. You see, John speaks of hearing and seeing and touching Jesus, and they're all very physical things to do. And by the way, the word know is used many times in his first letter. And it's a great study to look at all the things that God wants us to know. Uh, John's second letter joins knowing Jesus with living Jesus, with genuine love for others. And the third little epistle, it's a personal note of commendation to a man named Gaius, who joyfully expressed the spiritual gift of hospitality to many teachers of the word. Jude, Jude is the shortest book in the Bible and was written to expose people who were twisting the truth into false doctrines and so deceiving the people of God. Jude warns us that we will need to fight to keep the truth that underpins our faith. The faith, as he says, that God has given to us once for all. So Jude says, when it comes to what to believe, we've already been given the complete record. He likens false teachers to clouds without rain. They have all the show, but none of the substance, and therefore must be exposed and rejected. And now you come to the last book, the book of Revelation. And Revelation would be one of the most unread books in the New Testament. Yet it tells us what is and what was and what will be. Although it was written to the seven churches in Asia, which were likely established by Paul on his third missionary journey, the message of his book is for the church throughout history. You see, many Christians will take the meaning of this book to be referring to things that have already passed. Uh, others will look at it and believe that most are yet to be fulfilled. Well, one thing is for sure. This is the one book that tells us what Christ has saved us from, which is the wrath of a holy and a righteous God. And if we have not embraced by putting our trust in Jesus' death to free us from this judgment, then we will face the judgment because the holy nature of God will not let sin go unpunished. Either you ask Jesus to place his death against your debt, or you will spend eternity trying to cleanse your sin debt 
under the wrath of the holy God and it will never succeed. You know, this is, this is almost the, the greatest book in the Bible because in symbolic terms, it describes for us the life we will live reigning with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Think of that. All pain and sickness and sorrow and death and Satan and all that is associated with his evil will be totally destroyed and removed. And we who are in Christ will enjoy all that God has for us. You know, it is as Paul said, no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard. And it's beyond anything that could be comprehended within the hearts and the minds of anyone to think of the things that God has prepared for us. No wonder John closes his book with these words, come Lord Jesus, come. You see, our faith is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone and the foundation.